This morning I'm going to share from God's Word, and if you have never personally experienced the Holy Spirit moving in your life, if you've never been saved, you'll have an opportunity to do that before this time of worship is complete. If you have a copy of God's Word with you this morning, and I hope you do, I want to invite you to find your place in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40. Maybe place your finger there, a pen, a piece of paper, mark that place, then also find Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20. These two passages of Scripture contain what I like to call Jesus' two great teachings. Everybody say that word, great. It's perhaps a word we overuse in our modern society, but it's used and has been used throughout church history to refer to two of Jesus' most important teachings. One is called the Great Commandment. We find it in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40. The other is called the Great Commission. We find it in Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20. These are two passages of Scripture with which Christians ought to be well familiar. You ought to know these two teachings, these two passages of Scripture. I would dare say you ought to easily be able to recall the references, Matthew 22, 37 through 40, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and it would be helpful that you're able to quote them as well. We're going to look at these two passages of Scripture this morning as I begin preaching on Vision Month 2021. And this morning, I want to preach and speak on purpose, why we exist. Elihu Goldratt has said every organization was built for purpose. McDonald's has a purpose. AT&T has a purpose. Boys and Girls Club has a purpose. The local church has a purpose. And I would would contend this morning that the purpose of the church is a purpose that goes far beyond the purpose of any other organization on earth. But the truth remains, every organization was and is built for purpose. And when it comes to the purpose of the church, It's worth noting that these two passages I've put before us this morning, these two passages upon which I'm going to preach this morning, the Great Commandment, the Great Commission, form the ground zero, the basis for our purpose. Now, I hope you know this this morning as I begin sharing for Vision Month. I'm not deluded into thinking that I am some sage or guru who has the right or the ability to determine what the purpose of the church is. And this is what I love about being the pastor. I I, I realize this, I'm not creative enough to really cast a compelling vision for a church. I'm not smart and sophisticated enough to come up with some great idea and to convince you all to follow. I'm just a pastor. I'm just a jar of clay. I'm just a vessel. I'm just a God-called man, 1 Timothy 3, the Lord in his grace looked down and chose me to be a a Christian, then number two, he placed a desire within me to pastor and lead a church. Paul said, if any man desires the office of bishop, he desires a good work. And I believe this according to Scripture, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, when the Holy Spirit comes upon a believer at salvation, the Lord gives some spiritual gifts. And then the Lord in his providence places zeal, passion within some to preach the word and to lead in the context of a local church. And in time, a local church recognizes those who have been called according to God's purposes and they lay hands, Acts chapter 16, and they, Acts chapter 6, and they ordain some to the gospel ministry. Now, I, I was set apart at Roswell Street Baptist Church in Marietta to preach the word and to lead in this capacity in a local church. I felt that I had a calling and others recognized that and they affirmed that before the church. So as a result, I'm here today by the Lord's leadership and recognition of the, a local church leading and serving in this capacity. And I recognize this, I'm not wise according to the flesh and nor do I have the right to determine 
the vision for God's church. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs, without vision, the people perish. Now, now some are down on that verse, like you can't use it to speak of vision in local church, and they go back to the original meaning of that verse, and they'll say the original meaning or the real meaning is without prophetic revelation, the people perish. I say, well, that's good. It still speaks to vision. You see, as a church, we ought to have a vision and know this. Our vision ought to be based on the Lord's prophetic revelation. What is his prophetic revelation? Genesis through revelation, the word of God. God used the Holy Spirit, 2 Timothy 3.16, to inspire scripture. And so this morning, we know what God's vision ought to be for this local congregation. We know what God's heart is for the church because we have prophetic revelation. So most every man will proclaim his own goodness, the Proverbs say, but the counsel of the Lord will stand. Let's, as Tabernacle Baptists, understand this. Let's humble ourselves before the Lord and realize many people will boast of their own ideas and their own goodness. But the counsel of the Lord will stand. And we, may we as a church, may we as individual members, and may I as a pastor, may our staff and deacons be so slow to speak about our ideas and what we think and what we want and may we be quick to always say thus saith the Lord 21st century American culture there's a lot of churches there's a lot of church members there's a lot of preachers talking about their ideas the world does not need our ideas the world needs the truth of God so may may we this morning get back to ground zero may we get all of our words and thoughts plumb with the plumb line of Jesus Christ, the gospel, and the word of God. We've only got one sword that has the power to change lives, Ephesians chapter 6, and it is the sword of the Spirit, the word of God. The Lord's never going to use my opinions, my meddling, my ideas, and my thoughts to convert a soul, but he will use his word and the gospel to convert souls. So we come back to the plumb line of Scripture this morning. and We say, Lord, what is your purpose for the church? Why do we exist? Here in God's word through these two teachings, we see the Lord's heart for his church. One has said when creating or recreating your church's vision, the great commission and great commandment linked together should always be your singular starting point. What do these two teachings teach us? Number one, when it comes to our vision, why we exist, our purpose, we know this, we exist to know Christ. We exist to know Christ. This should be the first part of our purpose, the first part of our vision. This is why we exist, number one, to know Christ. And we see this clearly conveyed through the great commandment. Matthew twenty two thirty seven. when Jesus was asked, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in all of the law? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Jesus' statement was a response to a question asked by a, an expert in Jewish law in his day. Oh, and, and this is a first century situation we're looking at in the text, but know this, enough, little has changed over 2,000 years. There's still religious individuals who fancy themselves experts in all things related to God, Christ, and the church. There's a plethora of smorgasbord of ideas out there and many times wranglings and debates. And we need to cut through the muck of all of that stuff this morning if we want to be a pure bride who lets her light shine for Christ in this world, if we want to see our baptismal water stirred often, if we want to see men, women, boys, and girls growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, if we want to see a pure gospel advance in our age, we need to cut through all the muck of the religious debates and get back to the simplicity of Christ and the gospel. Jesus sought to do that here. He knew this man, according to Matthew twenty-two thirty-five, 35, was aiming to test him. 
Notice this was a religious individual who appeared sanctimonious on the outside, who engaged regularly in many religious activities, but he was misguided and deceived. And he missed out on the heart of God. And Jesus sought to bring him back to ground zero. Questions in Jesus' day concerning religious matters were many. And this debate concerning which law was most important was indeed a hot topic debate. One scholar has noted how scribes had broken the law of God down into 683 rabbinical commands added on top of the word of God. 683 commands given by rabbis or religious teachers in the day. The Pharisees had 683, a command for every Hebrew letter within the Ten Commandments. 248 of them were positive, do this. The remainder 365 were prohibitive, don't do such and such. So this expert in the law approaches Jesus and says, which out of all of them? Out of 638 is the most important. Rabbis love to have endless debates on this topic. Jesus sought again to cut through the muck and get to the point. He referenced Deuteronomy 6, 5, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus showed that a love, a devoted, consecrated love for the Lord is what's most important in the hearts of his people. Not debates over the law, not religious activity, not pontificating upon one's own religious opinions. Jesus showed that we are made to know God, to love him, to have a John 4, 24, soul to soul, spirit to spirit connection with him. Jesus' words remind us today, there's a church in 21st century America We need to uphold this as a standard and our purpose and our vision for our church. Men, women, boys, and girls are made to know God. They're made to love him. Jesus is pleased. Jesus gets great glory when people love him with their heart, their soul, their mind. His desire for you this morning is not for you to necessarily be religious, but for you you to have a real relationship with him. His desire this morning is for children in our preschool ministry and our children and students in our student ministry, senior adults, to have a real daily walk with him. His passion, his vision for our church is for us to be training people and ministering to people, preparing them for eternity. We exist to know God. This should be a fundamental part of our vision and our purpose here. As we aim to identify the purpose for our local congregation, we've got to keep this great commandment in mind. Love for the Lord is Jesus' greatest desire for people in our community. Consequently, we should regularly strategize of how we could help and aid people in knowing the Lord. All of our worship ministries, all of our gatherings, all of our discipleship programs should have this thing in mind, assisting people in knowing the Lord and growing in their relationship with him. Many churches would state their purpose in this matter by saying things like this, and I used this as a purpose statement before. We exist to help people know Christ. Now, I'm going to share at the end of this message what we're proposing as a staff and leadership here as a purpose statement for our church that we'll share regularly and we'll use that this as a as a a focal point for all of our ministries we'll we'll use it as a slogan if you will to drive all of our behavior and what we do here as a church but but realize first that this great commandment ought to be at the heart of it Uh, jesus desire is for people to love him to follow him. 
Why does Jesus have this desire? I remember speaking to one of my kids on the subject when he was younger. I've got one of these kids, you know, that thinks about everything and analyzes everything and asks a lot of questions. When we had a tragic death in our family, Laura's brother died at the age of 30. I can remember him asking at a very young age, six years old, why did God let this happen? We were talking on this topic one day, and he said this, and this is a debate I've had atheists throw at me before when witnessing. Why would God want us to love him? That sounds kind of egotistical. Now, he may not have used the word egotistical, but that was kind of the idea behind it. Good question, son. Then we begin to talk about this. If God is all perfect, if he is all knowing, if he is all powerful, if he is holy, 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 if he is the one that spoke the sun into existence and created this earth and created all things, if he is eternal, if he is perfect, that means he is greater than anything that exists. And if he is greater than anything that exists, and if we are created for him and his purposes, he knows this, we find real life and we find real satisfaction when we love him. Life makes sense. Life is complete when our hearts are set upon him. In fact, we find our best life when we find God, when we find Christ. Without the Lord, without Christ, our lives are mere cheap substitutes of what he intends. So a perfect God knows this. Our lives will be perfect when we find ourselves in him and when we pursue him with our hearts and when we love him. So it is not egotistical for him to want us to love him. In fact, it would be wrong for him to want any other thing for us. It would be wrong for the Lord to desire anything for us other than us loving him. He knows that this is what is best for us. As Blaise Pascal, the old French mathematician, once said, every human being ever created has a God-shaped vacuum hole in his or her heart. And it can only be filled by the Lord, by Christ. And God in heaven knows that you are made for him. Every man, woman, boy, and girl in Cartersville, Bartow County, in Georgia, in the United States of America, and the entire world has that God-shaped vacuum in his or her heart. And such people will never have true meaning or fulfillment, true joy, peace, and life until they come into a relationship with their creator. And so we exist for this reason, to help people know Christ, the great commandment. So this should drive what we do here on Sunday morning. We don't give too much space for announcements or what's going on in our community. I passed through a church one time, I got there and they had a birthday time on Sunday morning. Announced all the birthdays and sang happy birthday. I said, we ain't doing that no more. Why, preacher? We're here to know Christ. We're here to worship, to preach the word. We got time for that all week. Do that in your Sunday school class. I said it a lot nicer than that. We're here to know Christ. We've only got an hour. Y'all been telling me to be finished by noon. We're going to make sure we, we know Christ during this time. So our worship time, our small group, Sunday school, life group, whatever you want to call it time, sure there's time for fellowship and discussion and prayer requests, but ultimately the end goal is we're helping people know Christ. The great commandment should be at the center of our vision and our purpose. Number two, we, we move to the second part of our vision statement or purpose. We exist, secondly, to make Christ known. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, our second great teaching, and this teaching is known as the Great Commission, and many of you could quote it. Matthew 28, 19 through 20 contains some of Jesus' last words before he ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of the heavenly Father. 
And Matthew closed his gospel accounts with these words. We sang about the red letters earlier, and if your Bible has the red letters, you'll notice that Matthew here intentionally, strategically closes his gospel accounts with red letters. He wants the words of Jesus to be the last thing his readers read or his hearers hear. He wants his readers to to know that the gospel account did not end with the last word of his gospel Instead, the gospel account was intended to continue with faithfulness on the part of the church following what Jesus outlines here. Notice what Jesus says in Matthew 28, 19. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Notice here Jesus gives a command. There's one command in this text, and many get confused about this. The command is actually make disciples. Now, what we're going to see in just a moment, I'm going to break this verse down and give you the three participles or verbs in the text, but there's one command, and the command is make disciples. What is a disciple? Well, you could translate it as a follower, a learner, a pupil. Warren Wearsby translated the word as apprentice. He said apprentice might be an equivalent term. A disciple attached himself in the first century to a teacher, identified with him, learned from him, and lived with him. He learned not simply by listening, but also by doing. So here's what Jesus is calling us to do. He's calling us to make disciples. Of whom? Us? No, of himself. We exist as a church to make Christ known. This would be the second part of our purpose statement. So we exist to help people know Christ and then to make Christ known. We exist to know Christ and to make Christ known. And this act of making Christ known is an act of making disciples, of leading other people, other men, women, boys, and girls in our community to become followers, pupils, learners, Disciples, apprentices underneath Jesus. I I remember when I lived in Barnesville, Georgia, I went to Gordon College for two years, a a junior college at that time. There was a man in the local church I attended, a small church named Eddie, and he took me under his wing and began to uh, disciple me as a Christian. But he also, during that time, wanted to train me in his profession. I can still remember him asking me, because I I needed a job. He said, what skills do you have? Now, I wasn't bright enough at this time to, like, really listen to him and follow him and take his advice. I was telling him I need a job. I just wanted to make some money, to have some money on the side, to hang out with my friends and pay my car payment. He said, what skills do you have? And I gave a blank stare. Man, I'm like 18, 19. I don't have any skills. What are you talking about? I went to Ingalls and got a job as a bag boy. He was trying to help me. I didn't even realize. I look back on now. I'm like, that was so dumb. See, Eddie was a blacksmith. He shooed horses for a living, and then he also made stuff. It's a blacksmith. He had a forge at his house and a steel building out behind his house on his land. I remember he took me out there. He He was gracious, and he wasn't real direct about it, but showed me what he did and said, I could train you in this. You could be my apprentice. He took me out as he shoot a horse and I watched him I thought I don't want to do that I'll get kicked there's been many times I follow his Instagram account you can look it up Gallup Forge he makes beautiful stuff I thought not that I would have quit preaching or anything but I thought man I should at least let him train me and I could learn some things he wanted me to be an apprentice to spend time with him and to follow him he was trying to make me into his apprentice here's what we're to aim to do as a church we are to intentionally go out amongst people who are not Christians who do not know Christ who aren't saved who are destined for eternity separated from God and we are to work intentionally to try to make them into apprentices of Christ this is a part of our church we part of our purpose we exist to make Christ known now the question is how do we do that now this is a million dollar question there's a lot of debates in American churchianity about how we're to make disciples 
There's a lot of theories and philosophies. There's a lot of brands of Christianity. Drop yourself into any church, any community in America, especially in the South, and you're going to find Fruit Stripe, a variation of, of all different types of church churches with all different philosophies of how we make disciples. Even ask people after church, how do we make disciples? You're going to get a lot of opinions. Now, there's nothing wrong with that because the Lord uses all different types of people to reach all different types of people. He'll use your temperament and your spiritual giftedness to reach people in ways that I can't reach people. That's part of the Lord's divine design, and we need to be comfortable with that because Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 teaches that the Lord gives all of us different capacities spiritually. And we need to be careful that we're not the hand saying to the foot, I don't need you, or the ear saying to the eye, I don't need you. And so we need to be mature enough to recognize everybody ministers in different ways. But at the same time, we need maturity and wisdom to know that this text right here is the word of God and it is the authority for our lives and for our church. It is the standard. And within this text, the Lord gives us some simple A, B, C, heavenly instruction on how we are to go about making disciples. So here's my burden this morning. You ask the average church member, the average pastor, the average Christian in the Bible Belt or in America, how can we make more disciples of Christ? Many are going to focus on man-centered marketing techniques. Many are going to focus on stylistic things. What type of music you got? What's your church website look like? You got a good church logo? How's your preacher dress? What type of hair does he have? We're in trouble, tabernacle. Now, I'm not saying we never focus on those things. But if your first comment concerning how you reach people is the style of music, you need to check yourself. If our staff or our deacons or our leadership here ever gets what we wear and physical things first as a church, we need to do some soul searching. We might be guilty of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. You see, according to the word of God, the gospel is the power that changes lives. I think about... D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, I read his biography a few years ago, written by Ian Murray. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones was being interviewed by Westminster Church in London, and they asked him as they were interviewing him to come and be their pastor. He was going to move from Wales where he pastored and had a ministry where reaching a lot of people for Christ. And they said, what, what will you do to make our church grow? His response was, I have no weapons other than prayer, the gospel, and the Holy Spirit. And see, friends, I've been in meetings in our state convention, and I hear the talk of church folk and of preachers, and I'm grieved because those words, prayer, gospel, Holy Spirit, aren't often the first things on our lips. The, own, the words that come out of our mouths reveal where our trust is. That many times we really believe the power to change lives is in us and our methodologies. And Jesus here gives us divine revelation concerning how we make disciples. Notice here, okay, command is what? Make disciples. Notice there's three verbs here. There's three verbs in the original language that then describe how we make disciples. The first one is the word go. Everybody say go. I'm not going anywhere, y'all. I'm preaching. Don't tell me to do that. This word go, all right? What does this word mean? It's a command here. It's, excuse me. It's not a command. Some mistakenly take it for a command. It's really a participle. What's a participle? You describe an action one does on a consistent basis. Here, this word go could be translated while you are going. So, so this, this participle here, this word go, gives us heavenly insight about how we do the Great Commission. While we are going, we make disciples. What does Jesus mean? Making disciples is a lifestyle type of thing. 
It's not something for an event necessarily. It's not something for Sunday morning. Hey, let's get everybody here and the preacher will preach and convince them to become Christians. No, according to Jesus, this act of us being used to make him known is for every disciple, every follower through their lifestyle to go about their daily business and have an eye, have an aim on leading others to become disciples. This means, take a page from Billy Graham, he taught the idea of a circle of influence. And there was actually a card he created at one point, or his ministry created, where they had a circle and you'd write your name in the middle. And then around that circle, you'd write names of people with whom you regularly interact. And you'd stick that in your Bible and you'd pray for them each morning in your daily devotional time. See, this is the concept behind Jesus' great commission. Here's how we make disciples. See, many churches are mistaken in that they have this come and see mentality. Let's have carrot and stick and get people to church events and try to convince them to become Christians. No, the Lord calls us to go into our places of work and our neighborhoods and to shops and stores and banks and wherever we get a haircut at restaurants, ball fields, recreational activities and live the Christian life and love people and pray for them and look for opportunities to give them an answer for the hope that's within us. As you go, while you're going, See, so, so many churches, you plan a church in America now, what do you do? What style of music do we want to have? Let's take a survey of our community and figure out what people want. Let's be careful we kind of don't preach too hard and offend people and run them off. Jesus says, make disciples as you go. He gives a second participle here, a second verb, and that is baptizing. Verb baptize means to dip or to immerse. We, when we baptize, I'll baptize the next service. We dunk them under the water in a gracious fashion. Why? Because that's what Jesus told us to do here. And it, Romans 6, 3 through 4, gives a picture of Christian salvation. No, this baptism doesn't save you. Baptism isn't necessarily about church membership. You need to be baptized to become a church member. Baptism isn't about salvation or church membership. Know this about baptism. It is first and foremost about a person making a public profession that he or she has been born again and that he or she is following Christ. Let's get to the heart of baptism. Let's not lose the point. It's about a person professing that he or she has died to their old way of living and they are being raised to live a new type of life. Why is that important? There is power in this act. Jesus tells us that baptism is to be integral to our mission. Why? He knows by Holy Spirit, heavenly wisdom, that there is something intrinsically powerful about the act of baptism. Have you ever noticed this? Churches that don't baptize normally aren't growing denominations that don't teach baptism aren't really thriving. Why? The Lord has given baptism because he knows it is a powerful evangelistic tool. I've often said this, baptisms beget baptisms. In fact, I'll tell you this, the folks are gonna be baptized in our next service. They were here at a service to see someone else baptized and they came under conviction of their need to be saved baptisms beget baptisms why because it is an act of a public profession one is standing up before the church and they usually invite families and friends and they say i'm following christ and the preacher is able to say this is a symbol of how when you repent of your sins and believe in christ your old life is buried and you're raised to live a new type of life so know this while many churches are focusing on styles of music programs Dress and clothing, a bunch of material, man-centered stuff. Jesus says, make disciples, and here's how you do it. Everybody in church, get committed to while you're going and your circle of influence, living the Christian life and looking for people to witness to, loving people, shining the light of Jesus. When people get saved, baptize them. Make a big deal out of it. Teach them it's an opportunity for them to make a public profession. Invite people to be there to see that public profession. And then he gives us a third verb. He says, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. Everybody say that word teaching. This is an act of instruction. Know this teaching and instruction is important. The Christian life, 
that old retired officer at my last church, and he would say, there's different types of organizations, preacher. There's service organizations. There's business organizations into making money. There's informational organizations. He said, I kind of think of it like this. The church is an informational organization. We exist to share some really important information. And that important information is the power of God unto salvation. And know this, we are to regularly be sharing information, better word for it, truth. Jesus said in John 17, 17, when praying for us, for this church, he said, Lord, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. The way we become holy, the way we become set apart unto Christ, the way this bride becomes more pure and more effective in gospel ministry is this, the truth of God. As we continually set our hearts and minds on the Lord's truth, it has the power to transform our thinking and to transform our souls. So that's why we have preaching on Sunday morning. That's why we teach the word in our life groups. That's why we should regularly be discipling and training others in the truth of God. That's why we should be sharing the gospel with people who don't know Christ. We have this belief as people hear the word of God then they have the opportunity to change. So Christianity is a religion that places great importance on the, great emphasis on the importance of teaching. All Christians are called, 2 Peter 3.18, to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now notice, and I'll close here in just a minute, I promise. Verse 20, he says, teach them to observe everything I've commanded you. I used to pause right after the teaching and word teaching close my bible all right i'll teach folks notice jesus tells us what type of teaching we're to have we're to teach people to obey so it's not good enough that we just give people information we're to aim for transformation it's like the guy old guy told me one time he said preacher let me ask you a question you got these bible studies for women down there at the church this didn't happen here by the way my wife comes back from the church and her weekly Bible says she's got a notebook, she's got papers in there, highlighters, pens. She's been going to that thing for years and still talks to me like I'm a dog. What are y'all teaching down there? I said, well, I don't know about how your wife's talking to you. I'm sorry about that. But perhaps there's a breakdown between information and transformation. See, notice the words of Jesus here. We're to aim in all of our teaching to teach people. The word here is observe. Better translation is perhaps this, obey, follow, do what the Lord says. Why is this important? What does this have to do with our great commission? What does this have to do with our vision, our purpose? How does this help us make Christ known? Get this. It is in teaching people to actually follow Jesus' command that the church actually taps into the power that will grow the church. In a world in which styles of music, modes of communication, cleverly designed programs, and human-centered marketing techniques are often regarded as the most effective means of growing the church, Jesus' words here reveal that life transformation amongst the body is the more effective means of growing the church you you see when we are changed and when we become in what the lord wants us to be others will take notice and our lives will serve as a validation of the gospel see this was jesus end goal here the the lord i don't think the lord would be real impressed if I said, okay, we're changing our style of worship and we figured out what type of music everybody in our town likes and we're going to do that and I'm going to start dressing a certain way that will draw more people in and and I'm going to preach in a different fashion, a way that makes people feel good about themselves and we'll we'll, we'll sprinkle Bible in there and and say uh, we, we attract a bunch of people doing that. Is the Lord glorified in that? 
I, I think the Lord's more glorified when we stick to his truth and his word. And then when we live lives that reveal his character to others and others see Jesus in us and then they are drawn to Jesus. And then we proclaim the gospel message speak the truth in love, and the gospel performs its work of changing minds and changing hearts. That's when God is glorified. I'm afraid we're going to stand before the Lord one day, and a lot of American Christianity is going to be revealed to be little more than wood, stay, hay, and stubble, as Paul said. See, Jesus' means of evangelism is this. We live the Christian life and allow the Lord to use our testimony to change lives. That's what he taught us in Matthew 5, 13 through 16, when he said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It's no longer good for anything to be, but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights the lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand. And it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light so shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father in heaven. So the great commandment teaches us that we exist to know God. The great commission teaches us we exist to make God known. We exist to know Christ and to make him known. Now, at my previous church, I just took those two statements, our staff, our deacons, our leadership, took those two statements and said, hey, that's our mission statement. And we tweaked it a little bit. We were a downtown church in the heart of Lot, and we said, we're in the heart of Lot with a heart for knowing Christ and making him known. We, we sought to have the great commandment and great commission at the heart of what we did. You see, I believe every church, it helps for us to have a clear, concise, compelling and consecrated, that is, scriptural statement they use to explain why they exist. And I spent, I spent time over the last year, I've almost been here a year, speaking with our staff, key leaders, and saying, what could be a statement that we could have that encapsulate why we exist? And we landed on this, and I believe they may have it on the board, they may not. We exist to connect people to their ultimate purpose in life. In Jesus Christ. We exist to connect people to their ultimate purpose in life in Jesus Christ. So we believe that this ties into the great commandment. This is our ultimate purpose in life. Remember that God-shaped vacuum in the heart is to know Jesus Christ. And we exist to connect people to that very purpose. That's why we are alive. So you'll be hearing this more often. You'll hear it in announcements. You'll see it in publications. This will be our mantra, our battle cry, that this is why we exist, to connect people to the ultimate purpose in life, in Jesus Christ. Hopefully, it's a thing we'll easily remember. We'll see the scripture behind it. We'll share it regularly. We'll evaluate every ministry, everything we do under this microscope. Are we helping to connect people to their ultimate purpose in life, in Jesus Christ? Hey, this morning... Uh, maybe you're here and the reality is you've never connected to that ultimate purpose. I'm taking time as a pastor, been here almost a year, to have what we call a vision month where I share with the church vision, why we exist, and what we're to be doing as a church, what it looks like for us to fulfill our mission. And maybe you're here this morning and you realize you have never connected to that ultimate purpose in life in Jesus Christ.